in progress. Good morning, brothers. <clears throat> in our situation today, shall we seek the Lord's guidance? I know that there will be sisters that will join us eventually, but in this case, <clears throat> let us seek the Lord's guidance and see what he has to say for us in this day. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we have great need of you. We need to be prepared, Father. We need to be prepared for the cataclysm that is coming. We need your direction. We need your guidance. We need your blessing. Help us to study. Help us to take in and understand the words that you have presented through your prophet, through your scriptures. Help us now. Direct us in your way that we may do that which you would have us to do. Please send your Holy Spirit. Please send your angels to guide us, protect us as we open these words. For this, we thank you and we praise you now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. As we have been going through Judges 5, we came to a passage that is quite telling. Now, we need to be aware of this. We need to be very careful about this. Because if we are not, I think we will find that we will be walking in places that we should not. Okay, you're talking decryptically there, but... I'm speaking of Judges 5.23. Curse ye morose, said the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they come not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Yes, I'm speaking cryptically, but a lot of what I've read here, as I prepared for this study is quite blunt. We're gonna go through this as, as we can. There's a couple of points that stuck to me, stuck out very, very quickly. And we'll see if those, if those points stick with you as we go through this study. Now, this first section is from Testimony 16, Beginning on page 63. Testimony 16. Dear brother and sister, June 12th, 1868. I was shown some things in reference to your cases. You have a work to do, but see it not. You have not been burden bearers. You should feel greater interest in the work and the cause of God than you do. I was shown that you are blinded by the love of the world so that you do not see how great an influence the world has over you. You do not feel that a special weight of responsibility rests upon you. You do not realize the importance of the time and the work to be accomplished. You are like persons asleep. Unity is strength. There are so many backward ones who take no burdens that there is great feebleness in the church. You are not workers with Christ. The spirit of the world is shutting from your hearts impressions which the truth should make. It is important that everyone now come up to the work and act as though they were living men, laboring for the salvation of souls who are perishing. If all in the church should come up to the help of the Lord, we should see a revival of his work, such as we have not hitherto witnessed. God requires this of you and of each member of the church. It is not left with you to decide whether it is best for you to obey the call of God. Obedience is required, and unless you obey, 
you will stand on worse than neutral ground. Unless you are favored with the blessing of God, you have his curse. He requires you to be willing and obedient. He says, you shall eat of the good of the land. A bitter curse is pronounced on those who come not up to the help of the Lord. Curse ye morose, said the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they come not up to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Two classes. One is blessed and one is cursed. Two classes, each within the church. Two classes, each within the movement. Satan and his angels are in the field to oppose every step of advance God's people make. And the help of everyone is required. The influence of unbelieving friends affects you more than you are aware of. They bring you no strength, but darkness and unbelief. Now, <clears throat> this testimony is copied yet again in second testimonies. When you take a look at this in its original form, as we are doing right now, the paragraphs are set up very differently than what you're going to find in the one in second testimonies. What have we heard now just in these first two paragraphs? What what warning is being given? Are we not seeing a warning to Morose just as there has been warnings <clears throat> to the other tribes that would not heed the call of Deborah and Barak. Brother and sister, you have an individual work in the, vine in the vineyard of the Lord. You have thought and cared too much for yourselves. Set your hearts in order and then be in earnest. Inquire, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? God requires of you a deep, earnest searching out after him. He bids you search your own hearts diligently to discover all that prevents your bringing forth much fruit and that fruit that will remain. Why you possess no more of the spirit of God is you do not cheerfully bear the cross of Christ. In the last vision, I saw that you were deceived in regard to your strength of love for the world. The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and you become unfruitful. God has required us to bear much fruit. He will not command without giving with the command power for the performance of it. God will not do our part of the work. Neither does he require that we do his. It is God that worketh in us, but we must work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Faith without works is dead, being alone. Faith must be sustained by works. The doers of the work are justified before God. You displease God in talking of your poverty, while you have abundance, all that you possess belongs to him, yet he has seen fit to make you a steward of it for a short time. 
God is testing and proving you. How will you bear the test? He will require his own with usury. You have fixed your eyes upon the things you have done in different directions, and it looks large to you. But had you done very much more, you would have done no more than your duty. And you would have been far happier had your hearts expanded and your hands dispensed to the cause of God and the needy. God calls for you to bring your offering to the altar and not hold it within reach merely, but lay it on the altar. The altar sanctifies the gift when it is placed upon it and not before. You are not as separate from the world as God requires you to be. You see not, and you do not understand your danger. You are led astray by your love of the world. You both need to take a deeper draught at the fountain of truth. Unless you do come into a different condition, where you can honor God with your influence and your substance, the curse of God will come upon you. That is a direct but fearful statement. You may gather, but God will scatter. Instead of your health springing forth speedily, you will become like a withered branch. God calls for workers, men who can and will feel for the salvation of souls, and will sacrifice anything that they may be saved. No other one can do this work for you. The offerings of others, if ever so liberal, cannot take the place of yours. It is a surrender to God which you have to make which no other can make for you. It is only the Spirit's power working through mighty faith that can make you able to successfully resist the many snares Satan has laid for your feet. The words and the example of your Redeemer will be the light and strength of your heart. If you follow and trust in him, he will not leave you to perish. You fear too much the displeasure of those who do not love and serve God. Why should you wish to keep the friendship of your Lord's enemies or be influenced by their opinions? Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? If the heart was right, there would be a more decided separation from the world. Now, this is just part of what she wrote here. How pointed are these words to us within the movement today? I had to ask myself <clears throat> as I was going through this, how pointed are these words to me today? Not easy to read these. Now, this testimony, testimony 16, is republished as testimony, as second testimony 165.3. The biggest difference here is the way that the paragraphs are laid out and the fact that the editors have this written, Dear Brother and Sister N. So <clears throat> I will not repeat these words, but they are available for all to read. Sequentially. Second Testimonies 246.3. Let not the poor feel that there is nothing that they can do, 
because they have not the wealth of their brethren. They can sacrifice in many ways. They can deny self. They can live devoted lives. And in their words and acts, they can honor their redeemer. The sisters especially can exert a strong influence if they will cease their gossiping and devote their time to watchfulness and prayer. They can honor God. They can let their light so shine that others, by seeing their good works, will be led to glorify our Father, which is in heaven. An illustration of the failure on your part to come up to the work of God, as was your privilege. I was referred to these words. Curse ye Maraz, said the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Judges 5.23. What had Maraz done? Nothing. And this was their sin. They came not up to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Any comment so far? Well, I mean, it does describe our condition. Okay, next. Second Testimonies, 283.4. Dear sister, the, play, the praise of men and the flattery current in the world have had greater influence upon you than you have been aware of. You have not been improving your talents, putting them out to the exchangers. You are naturally affectionate and generous. These traits of character have been exercised to a degree but not as much as God requires. Merely possessing these excellent gifts is not enough. God requires them to be kept in constant exercise, for through them he blesses those who need to be helped and carries forward his work for the salvation of men. The Lord will not depend upon niggardly souls to take care of the worthy poor nor to, to, to sustain his cause. <clears throat> Such are too narrow-minded. They would grudge the smallest pittance to the needy in their distress. They would also want the cause narrowed down to meet their limited ideas. To save means would be the prominent idea with them. Their money would be more valuable to them than precious souls for whom Christ died. The lives of such, so far as God in heaven are concerned, are worse than a blank. God will not trust his important work with them. Curse ye morose, said the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof. Because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. What had Morose done? Nothing. This was their sin. The curse of God came upon them for what they had not done. The man with a selfish, narrow mind responsible for his niggardliness. But those who have kindly affections, generous impulses, and a love for souls are laid under weighty responsibilities. For if they allow these talents to remain unemployed and to waste, they are classified with unfaithful servants. The mere possession of these gifts is not enough. Those who would have them should realize that their obligations and responsibilities are increased. <clears throat> Could somebody else read this next par paragraph? The master will require each of his servants to give an account of his stewardship, to show what he has gained with the talents entrusted to him. Those to whom rewards are given will impute no merit to themselves for their diligent trading. They will give all to the glory of God. They speak of that which was delivered to them as thy pound 
not their own. When they speak of their gain, they are careful to state whence it came. The capital was advanced by the master. They have traded upon it successfully and returned the principal and interest to the giver. He rewards their efforts as if the merit belonged to them when they owe all to the grace and the mercy of the bountiful giver. His words of unqualified approval fall upon their ears. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Now, <clears throat> what parable are we hearing about here? Is this not the parable of the talents? Mm -hmm. Here is Christ, who is the angel of the Lord, combining the warnings given to Morose with the parable of the talents. Does this not show two classes? Those that are unwilling to help in the work of the Lord and those that are willing to give all. The next passage. Second Testimonies 394. Sister E, you cannot realize the many blessings you have lost by making the failings of others a balm to soothe your conscience for a neglect of your duty. You have been measuring yourself by others. Their crooked paths, their failings have been your textbook. But their errors, their follies and sins do not make you disobedient, do not make your disobedience to God less sinful. We regret that those who should be a strength to you in your efforts to overcome your love of self, your pride of heart, your vanity and love of the approbation of worldlings have been only a hindrance by their own lack of spirituality and true godliness. We cannot tell you how much we regret that those who should be self-denying Christians are so far from coming up to the standard. Those who should be steadfast abounding in the work of God are weakened by Satan because they remain at such a distance from God. They fail to obtain the power of his grace through which they might overcome the infirmities of their nature and by obtaining signal victories in God, show those of weaker the faith, the way, the truth, and the life. That which has caused us the greatest discouragement has been seen in those in blank who have had years of experience in the cause and work of God, shorn of their strength by their own unfaithfulness. Where do we find a passage where one had years of experience in the cause and work of God, and yet was shorn of his strength. Well, I mean, you're talking about Samson, or I would say so. I would say so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they are outgenerated by the enemy in nearly every attack. Outgeneraled. Outgeneraled. Okay, you're right. Please excuse my my incorrect reading on that. That's okay. God would have made these persons strong, like faithful sentinels at their post, to guard the fort had they walked in the light 
he had given them and remained steadfast to duty, seeking to know and to do the whole will of God. As we read this, as I read this specifically, how, if we look at this within the movement, can we compare this with what occurred on December 6th? Mm -hmm. Satan will, no doubt, through his delusions, deceive those, deceive these delinquent souls and make them believe that they are about right after all. They've committed no grievous outbreaking sins and they must, after all, be on the true foundation and God will accept their works. They see no special sins to repent of, no sins which call for special humiliation, humble confession and rending of heart. The delusion upon such is strong indeed when they mistake the form of godliness for the power thereof and flatter themselves that they are rich and have need of nothing. The curse of Miraz rests upon them. My sister, excuse not your defects because others are wrong. In the day of God, you will not dare to plead as an excuse for your neglect to form a character for heaven. That others did not manifest devotion and spirituality. The same lack which you have discovered in others was in yourself. And the fact that others were sinners makes your sins nonetheless grievous. Both they and you, if you continue in your present state of unfitness, will be separated from Christ and will with Satan and his angels be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. One of the points that my mother for many years tried to drill into me is the faults you see in others are the ones you most need to correct in yourself. When one within the movement made the accusation to me that I was too much of the world. I had to step back. There are points, yes. There are things that I need to release through self-examination, through reliance upon Christ, and through faith in him. But when I am given a challenge like this from another, for me, it is a fearful denunciation because when they are accusing me of such, as it is with me, so it is with them. We are responsible for our own characters. The same lack which you discovered in others was in yourself. <clears throat> I don't think that she could have put it any more bluntly. This next section is Second Testimonies 426. Our great exemplar was exalted to be equal with God. He was high commander in heaven. All the holy angels delighted to bow before him. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, 
and let all the angels of God worship him. Jesus took upon himself our nature, laid aside his glory, his majesty, and his riches to perform his mission, to save that which was lost. He came not to be ministered unto, but to minister unto others. Jesus, when reviled, abused, and insulted, did not retaliate. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When the cruelty of man caused him to suffer painful stripes and wounds, he threatened not, but committed himself to him who judgeth righteously. The Apostle Paul exhorted the Philippian brethren, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Is the servant greater than his master? Christ has given us his life as a pattern, and we dishonor him when we become jealous of every slight and are ready to resent every injury, supposed or real. It is not an evidence of a noble mind to be prepared to defend self, to preserve our own dignity. We would better suffer wrongfully a hundred times than wound the soul by a spirit of retaliation or by giving vent to wrath. There is strength to be obtained of God. He can help. He can give grace and heavenly wisdom. If you ask in faith, you will receive. But you much you must watch unto prayer. Watch, pray, work should be your watchword. Your wife might be a blessing if she would only take upon her the responsibility that it is her duty to take. But she has shunned responsibility all her life and now is in danger of being influenced instead of influencing you. Instead of having a softening, elevating influence upon you, there is danger of her thinking as you think and acting as you act without reaching down deep to be guided by principle in all her actions. You must sympathize with each other and unfortunately help each other to view matters incorrectly. You sympathize with each other and unfortunately help each other to view matters incorrectly. She can exert an influence for good, but she possesses a spirit which savors of spiritual indolence and sloth. She is reluctant to engage in any good work if it is not pleasant and agreeable. What was the sin of Miraz? Doing nothing. It was not because of great crimes that they were condemned, but because they did not come up to the help of the Lord. How many times does she need to tell us this? Okay, can somebody read this next paragraph, please? Ministers especially should know the character and works of Christ that they may imitate him. For the character true Christian are like his. He laid aside his glory, his dominion, his riches, and sought after those who were perishing in sin. He humbled himself to our necessities that he might exalt us to heaven. Sacrifice, self-denial, and disinterested benevolence characterized his life. He is our pattern. Have you, Brother A, imitated the pattern? I answer, no. He is a perfect and holy example given for us to imitate. We cannot equal the pattern, but we shall not be approved of God if we do not copy it. And according to the ability which God has given, resemble it. 
love for souls for whom Christ died will lead to a denial of self and a willingness to make any sacrifice in order to be co-workers with Christ in the salvation of souls. The second Timothy 541, second testimony is rather 549.1. Okay. <clears throat> Who are the ministers? We are. Andrews. But we don't have a degree from another theological seminary. How can we be ministers? How know this man <laughs> letters having never learned? Right. Each one of us is called to minister where we are. I read this. I think of friends that have chosen <clears throat> that not to minister where they are, but they are being, quote, called to a great mission field. The great mission field that is before us is that which is right now directly in front of us. The work of God's chosen servants will be fruitful if wrought in him. <clears throat> Their words and works are the channels through which the pure principles of truth and holiness are conveyed to the world. Their exemplary lives make them the light of the world and the salt of the earth. The servants of God should, with the hand of faith, lay hold of the mighty arm and gather the divine rays of light from above, while, with the hand of love, they reach after perishing souls. Diligence is necessary for this work. Indolence will permit souls who might be saved to drift beyond reach. God wants in his servants ministers who are awake, who are energetic and persevering, who are faithful watchmen upon Zion's walls listening to hear the words from the divine teacher and faithfully proclaiming the same to the people. You are very much like Miraz. Here again, I have to substitute it this way. I am very much like Miraz. You are quite diligent when that which you do will bring some advantage to yourself. But there is no motive for special diligence unless you are to be benefited. You are decidedly a lazy man. You can eat your rations regularly, but you have no special love for physical labor. No man can fill his position as a minister unless he is industrious, diligent in business, and faithful in the performance of all the social and public duties of life. God has chosen us as his servants to his work, which requires persevering energy. We are not to become pets and shun toil, hardship, and conflicts. <clears throat> I was referred to the following words of inspiration. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. 
We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. The, the sufficiency of the apostle was not in himself, but in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, whose gracious influences filled his soul, bringing every thought into subjection and obedience to Christ. His ministry was fruitful. The first great commandment is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments, the whole interest and duty of moral beings hang. What is being said here? On these two commandments, the whole interest and duty of moral beings hang. We are not to be amoral. We are to be as Christ was, living according to the commandments and the precepts that he has given. Those who do their duty to others as they would that others should do to them are brought into a position where God can reveal himself to them. They will be approved of him. They are made perfect in love, and their labors and prayers will not be in vain. They are continually receiving grace and truth from the fountainhead, and as freely transmitting to others divine light and salvation they receive. In them is fulfilled the language of the scripture. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Selfishness is abomination in the sight of God and holy angels. Because of this sin, many fail to attain the good which they are capable of enjoying. They look with selfish eyes on their own things and do not love and seek the interest of others as they do their own. They reverse God's order. Instead of doing for others what they wish others to do for them, they do for themselves what they desire others to do for them and to do to others what they are most unwilling to have returned to them. Here is where you need to learn. Love is of God. You have not the love which dwelt in the bosom of Christ. The unconsecrated heart cannot originate or produce this plant of heavenly origin, which in order to flourish <clears throat> must be watered constantly with the dew of heaven. <clears throat> it can flourish only in the heart reigns. This love cannot live and flourish without action. It cannot act without increasing in fervency and extending and diffusing its nature to others. This principle you have greatly lacked, and thus all has been dark where its presence would have been made light. The first sentence here is quite telling. How much of this are we seeing currently within the movement? How much of this are we seeing within the church? Or within ourselves. Or within ourselves is right. Because that which we see <clears throat> within the church, within the movement, is a direct reflection upon ourselves, right? 
Mm -hmm. It's not easy to have to look at ourselves in such an unflattering manner. But the only person that you cannot lie to is the man or woman in the mirror. Especially the mirror of Christ. When B.F. Snook embraced the truth, he was very destitute. And this is Second Testimony 625. Liberal souls deprive themselves of conveniences and even of some of the necessities of life to help this minister, whom they believe to be a faithful servant of Christ. They did all this in good faith, helping him as they would have helped their Savior. <clears throat> But it was the means of ruining the man. His heart was not right with God. He lacked principle. He was not a truly converted man. The more he received, the greater was his desire for means. He gathered all he could from his brethren until he had been helped through their liberalities to a valuable home. Then he apostatized and became the bitterest enemy of the very ones who had been the most liberal to him. This man will have to render an account for the means that he has taken from true-hearted believers in the truth. He did not rob them, but the treasury of God. He did not rob them but he robbed the treasury of God. We wish him no evil, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. He has walked in the ways of his heart and in the sight of his eyes, but for all these things, God will bring him into judgment. All the hidden things of darkness will then be brought to light, and the secret counsels of the heart shall be made manifest. <clears throat> Brother B, you are not as these men. We would not compare you to them, but we would say, beware of walking in their footsteps and of having your conversation with covetousness. This desire on the part of ministers to obtain for selfish purposes is a snare to them, which, if they continue in, will prove their overthrow. As they, as they get their eyes upon self, their interest in the prosperity of God's cause, and their love for poor souls become less and less. They do not lose their love for and interest in the truth at once. Their departure from the cause of right is so gradual and imperceptible that it is frequently difficult to tell the time when the change in them took place. I think your course highly dangerous. You have not felt the necessity of heeding the light which God has given you and arousing yourself to save your family acquitting yourself as a father and priest of your, of your household. You do not deny the light given. You do not rise up against it, but you neglected to carry it out because it was not convenient and agreeable to your feelings to do this. Therefore, you were like morose. You came not up to the help of the Lord, although the matter was of so vital consequence as to affect the eternal interests of your children. You neglected your duty. In this respect, you were a slothful servant. 
You have but little sense of how God regards the neglect of parents to discipline their children. Had you reformed here, you would have seen the necessity of the same effort to maintain discipline and order in the church. Your slackness in your family has been seen also in your labors in the church. You cannot build up the church until you are a transformed man. The neglect of the light that God has given you has, in a degree, made you captive, subject to Satan's devices. Therefore, a door has been left open for him to gain access to you in other directions and to make you a weak man. He sees that he has succeeded in binding your eyes, blinding your eyes to the interest of your family by leading you to neglect the light which the Lord has given. Then Satan has beset you in another direction. He has excited your love of traffic, your love of gain, and thus your interest has been divided from the cause and the work of God. <clears throat> the love of God and the truth is gradually becoming of less importance. Souls for whom Christ died are of less value to you than your temporal interests. If you continue to pursue this course, you will soon become jealous, sensitive, and envious, and will go away from the truth as others have gone. Second Testimonies 627. Now, of these passages, what can we note? What can we see directly? Well, we can see we're in the same condition as the people of Morose, that every one of us is in this danger. And this warning is to this movement at this time. That we don't really have as much interest in the cause of God as we profess to. Okay. And, and yeah. it's seen by our actions and by the divisions that are caused. Okay. Anything else? Well, people are neglecting the light that God has given. There was something very simple that, it, that came to me as, as I'm going through these. All of these are presented in second testimonies. Mm-hmm. If I've understood this correctly, all seven of these warnings were presented in 1868. Mm -hmm. Why would she be given seven examples of the picture of Moreau's all within this one year. The church had been formed. The church at that time was in Laodicea, just as it is now. Of the hundred or so published examples of what Mrs. White wrote about Moreau's. The first seven were given in the space of one year. This is a kind of warning not unlike 
being warned that Christ was about to return to heaven. In unity, there is strength. The offer has been made for us all to examine ourselves and the movement and become unified. The choice is upon all. The duty that is being done here in these morning meetings is to extend the offer to those within the movement, but especially to those that are seeking to be separate, that we are not separate. We are here to study together. We are here to learn together. We are here to grow together. I had a conversation yesterday with another sister who is in the movement, who is recognizing that unity is not existing at this time within the movement. We have many fractures. We have many separations. We have the great need of unity and the great need of a, a stronger relationship with Christ himself. Now, what else can we say here? Each of these admonitions are given for us each. For there's facets within our lives that each of these warnings are touching on. The question is for us, are we going to accept these words of warning or are we going to set them aside? Are we going to come to the aid of the Lord or are we going to decide not to do so? What character are we developing? What robe are we wearing? Now, as I've sent this on, this morning, it is for me with a heavy heart because I know that these messages in Zephaniah, here with this that we're seeing in the song of Deborah and Barak, they're not easy to give. It's not unlike what Jeremiah had to give. Now we must decide for ourselves. It may be worthwhile for others to look even further into this with Morose. Each of these passages are right now put in order according to where they were published in Second Testimonies. There may be a lot more yet to be revealed. Now, let's see. We left off yesterday in this portion of Judges. We were coming to these verses 
because as, as we had noted, the mother of Sisera looked out a window and cried through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariots? Her wise ladies answered her, yea, she returned answer to herself. She returned her words to herself. Who had we decided that the mother of Sisera represents? Is it not the Church of Rome, the Romish Church, at this time in verse history? Mm -hmm. Have they not sped? Have they not divided the prey to every man a damsel or two? To Sisera, a prey of, div of divers colors? A prey of divers colors and of needlework, of divers colors of needlework on both sides, meat for the necks of them that take the spoils. So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might, and the land had rest. 40 years. Chronologically, how many times was the land given rest for 40 years? How many times do we find in the Bible that the land was given rest for 40 years? How many, how many times, just say in the book of Judges, did we see that the land was given rest for 40 years? I think at least three. Okay. Could we apply those three periods of 40 years to being a symbol of the three angels' message of Revelation 14? Well, there's more than three. Judges 3.11, the land had rest 40 years, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Judges 5.31, uh, which we just looked at, the land had rest 40 years. Judges 8.28, and the country was in quietness 40 years in the days of Gideon. And Judges 13.1, and the children of Israel did eat again in the sight of the Lord. Well, I guess in this one, it would be the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. So I guess there's three times the land had rest, one time that the land is delivered into the hand of the Philistines in Judges. So that could be like a 3-1 combination. All right. Could it be said that the one time where the land was delivered into the hand of the Philistines, that this was a symbol of judgment? Well, yeah. But you have these three 40-year periods. Hmm. Okay, just a couple of chronological notes about what you read. Okay. Now, um, there's a, a few little things that I did in, in trying to examine this. Uh, the first was I took the year 1868, and I looked at it as a period of months. That is, I multiplied 1868 by 30. And when you do that, you get um, 
uh, what was it, 56,040. And then I counted from that date um, 56,040 days. And that gave me November 17th, 2021. So what's the significance of November 17th? Repeat that, please. What's the significance of November 17th, just as a symbol? Well, uh, we relate it to 2019 and the pandemic. Okay, so, so it happens in the pandemic in 2019, but this is going to be 2021. But 1117 itself? So Aran put it there in the chat. 11 times 17 is a Yeah. OK. Now, um, so then, um, so that's one thing I did. The other is I was looking at um, these different spans of time that I have uh, taken from uh, the calculations so i have lots of different spans of time but taken from the calculations of the tribes um, so this one specifically is a 56,350 which is the total of the differences between the tribe of benjamin and um, the other tribes so the tribes of benjamin from numbers 26 compared to uh, all the other tribes um, including itself so that's all the differences so so the tribe of Benjamin compared to all the tribes in numbers chapter 1 and 2 and that's a number that's 56,350 so it, it's just a number that I knew related to our time because of the span of time um, and that one's going to bring me to uh, September 23rd, 2022, which is still coming up. So that's 56,350 days from the writing of this letter. And September 23rd is a symbol that we have. Um, it's 723 as a symbol, even though it's the ninth month, we can also look at September as the seventh month as a symbol. It's also early writings, page 74, that the Lord showed me on September 23rd. Of course, we know that that's actually October 23rd, but it doesn't matter. It still is a symbol there. And also September 23rd, 2017, when I first presented July 18, 2020. So, um, there, so anyway, there is these... Um, ways that we can look at this letter that it relates to our time so we're counting you know from that date june 16th 1868 what else could we do with that i don't know if that's with the date june 16th Or not June 16th, it's June 12th, 1868. So what is June 12th a symbol of? One twenty-six. So it's a symbol of the 2520 or God's judgment. Any other thoughts on that, on those numbers? Yeah, the six times the 12 would be uh, 72, which is half of 144. Yeah. And then you get Samuel Snow if, if you scramble them, the 216. Six times yeah. six times. Yeah, yeah you could. I was looking in Proverbs 31, 21. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed 
with scarlet and scarlet is translated double double garments right and here it says needlework on both sides so i was wondering if there's a connection or a counterfeit mm -hmm. faithful church compared to the very apostate church but both have double garments and of course scarlet is is linked with the papacy but it's also royalty you know or I, with purple so you're trying to take the 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 needlework here stuff as counterfeit well if we're saying this is rome and how she infiltrates and subverts all the churches and how she's infiltrated and subverted many in this movement like we are a church and then i thought well I remember reading Proverbs 31, maybe in 2018, and I was looking up Scarlet. And I don't know where I read this, but it says it should be translated double garments. So if you could confirm that, because yeah, I did I not look it up. No, no. So that's how you're trying to get double garments in Scarlet here? In well, I was just curious because it came into my mind. I want to know, you know, if there's a verification. Well, well, I still kind of am sticking to the fact that this represents to the prey is um, is is this movement. So this needlework of diverse colors is referring to to us. Oh, we're not the only ones being preyed on by Rome, believe me. I know, but we we're, might be the main target, or we might soon become the main target, but we're not the only ones. But this, we're applying all of this specifically to this movement. In our application, we can't step outside of that if we're going to understand this application. So, the, in this application, the prey of diverse colors, the prey of di diverse colors of needlework, of diverse colors of needlework on both sides, as it says um is referring to this movement and cicero did not uh divide the prey according to this right because this is the mother of cicero this is what she is looking for but it didn't this happen. is what she envisioned this is what she was hoping for right yeah but it didn't happen so that's right. what that's how we could take this so let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might. So this is this is the victory of God's people. This is uh, the church triumphant uh, being victorious. Okay. I, that's the way that I understand it. I, I, you know, it. I wouldn't try to apply it outside of this. Well, I I agree with you, but I also know that since it's Rome that's saying this, this is Rome's forecast. This is Rome's blueprint of conquest right here, and it's yeah. contrasted with the triumphant church in Proverbs thirty one. Right. So and that means that that means that it, and Psalm 68 and other places. So that means this has to refer to this movement in the context of which we're taking it. But it has to refer to God's people. The prey is is not is not the bad people. The prey is the good people because they're not conquered by Rome. Because this is we, this is the mother of Cicero. By Rome. All of us have been influenced by Rome. Like yeah, coming this, out of Babylon, coming out of different churches, it's coming out of I know, our you mindset. Keep missing, you keep missing the point. This is the mother of Cicero mourning or lamenting the death of Cicero and the fact that he did not do this, that he did not, he was not victorious. So, so you you can't apply the 
the diverse colors to something negative. This has to be, this has to be the characters of Christ. This has to be the work of the sanctuary that is not taken as a spoil. So we can't we can't take this symbol and try to apply it to the papacy because this is the thing that the papacy did not conquer. Even even if you tried to bring it outside of this movement, it's still God's people. Does that make sense? Well, it, it's making sense because the mother of Sisera is removed from the battle. Mm -hmm. You've got the mother of Sisera hidden, in a manner of speaking, away from the battle. Yeah. She is, she is not there when J.L., slays Sisera. Mm -hmm. Neither is Sisera's commander, his king. There. Right, right. And that's where we had talked about in chapter four, because that's going to be Jabin, king of Canaan. So here we have a civil power represented, which we would say is the civil power of the Romish church. If you want to look at it that way right but here the imagery in chapter five is this of a church a mother but this is her lament this right. is not this is not something that she accomplished this is this is her lament that sisera did not come back from battle victorious so uh, all i'm saying is that we need to be we need to be clear on how we're interpreting a passage we can't just look at a symbol and without understanding how we are making the application. <clears throat> Angela, is that I don't understand how I've been making the application as per my experience. That's yeah, not, I'm not saying they're wrong, but I also agree with myself in the sense I know how Rome operates. I was raised in this in this stuff. Yeah, but and I don't... I've done research on it and I've consulted others about it and they consulted me about it. We yeah. know how Rome operates. I understand that. And there are people who know far more than I do. I got out of there because I knew I was the next target of these yeah. bastards. But all I'm saying this is what how they operate in my own to, family. So so what you have to all I'm saying is that you're looking at this symbols here that's referring to this movement, right? Because this diverse colors of needlework, I believe, is representing the, uh, the sanctuary, which is representing this character of God's people, the character of Christ that's seen on God's people. And I don't see how we can take this. I mean, we understand the Catholic Church exists, and it's a counterfeit. But in the context here, this can't be referring to something of the Catholic Church. This has to be okay. referred to not the counterfeit, but the real, right? In the context, yes, I understand that. But on the other hand, of course, it's going to trigger a lot of stuff because I've been through this. Yeah, I And if I, I'm glad I got out at the age of, of 16 and changed countries even to escape them. Not yeah. that they didn't exist where I was living, where I was next living, but they didn't know anything about me. I didn't connect with them. They didn't target me like they were in Montreal and wherever, especially in Montreal. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's, that's all I'm saying. So we have this contrast. Uh, what, what, Rome hoped to do through Sisera is defeated and and God's church is victorious and then they had then and the land had rest 40 years now this is the third period of 40 years of rest so if there's three periods and this is the I mean, this is the second of the three periods pardon me 
So this is the second. The second would represent the second angel's messages. Right? Agreed. Second, mm -hmm. yeah, second angel's message. Which is primarily what this movement is about. Second angel's message. Preparation for the Sunday law. Then what do you do with the 80 years between the first and the second 40 year period? Okay, you're saying there's 80 years between the first and the second? Well, you had um, Othniel and then you had Ehud um, and he judged for 80, it says 80 years connected with him. Okay, so that, which verse is that again? That's uh... Uh, it's in Judges chapter 3, I think maybe 31, around that time. Okay. Yeah, so that's verse 30, yeah. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest four score years, which is 80. So you're saying there's 40, 80, and 40 again. Mm-hmm. Okay. So is that how you have it in your chronology specifically? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's interesting. So, so what would you make of that then? I don't know. I'm trying to think. I've been thinking about it, but uh, but uh, I can't really seem to place it anywhere. We do have uh, after Othniel. There was oppressors, there was Eglon, Jabin, and then Midian. Yeah. There are 18, 20, and 7 are the years of oppression. Yeah, so which is saying, July 18, 2020, as a symbol. So, yeah. So I had that idea. Yes. Okay. Yeah, there's, so there's definitely some symbols here that we would need to... Uh, to understand. I mean, it's hard to know if it's how that that all fits together, because that's part of the problem is that we have some overlapping periods. Mm -hmm. So which ones specifically overlap where? Um, I don't know if we have enough information to figure that out, but we can at least see them as the periods as symbolic, even if they overlap with, with another period. I know judges is such a difficult time when it comes to the to actually working out the details of the periods, but but at least we have the understanding of this symbolically. Okay. Yeah, so, so you're saying the children of Israel, they served Eglon, that's uh, Judges 3.14, the king of Moab, 18 years. Mm -hmm. and, and where are we placing that in context with these other spans of time? Like, because that's Judges 3. We also have 18 years in Judges 10.8. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> For signs and Ammon. Yeah, our time is kind of up, I think Dwight is saying. Yes. I have to take my mother to a doctor's appointment. Okay. Well, if you want to close with prayer. Okay. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for your words of warning. We thank you for your words of admonition. We thank you for your words of preparation for that which we need to be aware of today. Direct us now, guide us, so that in all things that we do, we might bring glory to your name and to your character. 
I thank you, Father, for each one that have attended today and for those that will listen later. Help us to continue to grow, to look to you, to be strengthened by you, so that we may be unified in you in all that we are to do for this. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah.